Early on the morning of the 19th of June, 1942, an unarmed German liaison plane glided to Earth near Red Army positions. There was no trail of smoke or obvious reason for its crash landing. When Soviet troops later captured the aircraft, they found a single bullet hole through its petrol tank. The pilot was killed in the shootout that followed before he could destroy his briefcase, which contained top secret documents. Red Army soldiers grabbed the prize and brought it back to their trenches. The dead German was Major Reichel, head of operations for the German 23rd Panzer Division. He was carrying plans for a forthcoming operation codenamed Case Blue. The offensive was part of Hitler's plan to capture the Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus region. Major Reichel's documents revealed just a small part of the operation, and there was always the risk that they were planted by the Germans to deliberately mislead the enemy. After examining the captured papers, Stalin advised caution. It is safe to assume that similar plans have been developed for all the other fronts as well, he wrote. But Case Blue was for real. It was launched by the Wehrmacht on the 28th of June, 1942. Case Blue called for German Army Group South to split into two parts. Army Group A was to attack the Caucasus region and seize the Soviet oil fields. Army Group B, led by Paulus's Sixth Army, was to advance eastwards towards the Volga River and Stalingrad, covering the advance into the Caucasus. The German columns dashed towards Voronezh, Stalingrad and Rostov-on-Don. Despite the warnings, the Red Army's southern sector hadn't received nearly enough reinforcements to withstand the impact. Soon, the Soviets were in full retreat. During a meeting of the Stavka, the Soviet High Command, Stalin turned to Front Commander Timoshenko and demanded, why does the Front Command not know where its troops are? As far as I recall, there were 14 divisions in those armies. That's over 100,000 soldiers. Timoshenko was removed from command within days. Vasily Gordov became the new Front Commander. But a new commander was not enough to salvage the situation. The army's retreat continued as one population center after another fell to the Nazis. Soviet soldiers surrendered in growing numbers. Many of them went across to the enemy, becoming the so-called Hivi. The term Hivi came from the German Hilfswillige, meaning those willing to help. It referred to Soviet citizens, including ex-soldiers, who volunteered to help the German armed forces. They usually served in support roles, such as drivers, medical orderlies, or cooks. As the Red Army retreat continued, Stalin issued his famous Order No. 227. It gave birth to the famous slogan, Not a Step Back. The order read, All talk about us having plenty of room in which to retreat endlessly, about our territory being vast, our country being large and rich, our population numerous, and they're always being bred in abundance. All this talk must be eliminated. We will not tolerate any commander or commissar who allows their unit to leave its positions without authorization. Panic mongers and cowards must be exterminated on the spot. So-called blocking detachments were created. These units had orders to fire on their own men if they tried to retreat. Many approved of the order. It should have been issued earlier, one Red Army soldier wrote. If it had, we wouldn't have given up our winter positions. Many thought the order would prove impossible to enforce. The blocking detachments were rarely more than a few hundred strong and often made up of the worst soldiers in the unit. The four blocking detachments of the 62nd Army totaled 650 men. They were expected to enforce a no-retreat order on an army of 56,000 men. In reality, blocking detachments were only good for rounding up malingerers and sending them back to the front. 
but new slogans and blocking detachments were not going to stop the Wehrmacht. In crowded railway stations across the Soviet Empire, new recruits were ordered aboard their railway transports. From all corners of the land, troop trains rolled towards the River Don. Meanwhile, German troops were continuing their advance on Stalingrad. The 6th Army had almost reached the Don, but its commander was uneasy. Friedrich Paulus had served as chief of staff in various army divisions since 1935. He'd helped to plan Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the USSR. When Field Marshal von Reichenau, commander of the 6th Army, died of natural causes, Paulus was given command. Paulus's superiors described him as clever and talented, but questions remained about his decisiveness. With his staff officer background, Paulus had more the air of a civil servant than a general. He was not lionized by his men, as his predecessor von Reichenau had been. It was Paulus's lot to be constantly compared to von Reichenau, much to his irritation. The 6th Army consisted of 270,000 men, 3,400 guns and mortars, and 350 tanks, supported by 1,100 aircraft. The Soviet Stalingrad front could muster 300,000 troops, 5,500 guns, 230 tanks, and 1,000 aircraft. Although the Red Army had a numerical superiority, its forces had to cover a front of more than 500 kilometers. Paulus, in contrast, could gather his forces into a single fist, ready to smash east towards Stalingrad and the Volga. The Germans began their advance across the Don steppe. Here, the Don River, running north to south, comes very close to the River Volga before turning southwest to form a long bend. Within that bend, the Soviet armies dug in. The steep Don riverbank, between 25 and 30 meters high, made retreat difficult. A German breakthrough here could leave Soviet troops trapped on the wrong side of the river. For the Red Army, to stand and fight was the only option. The German offensive at the Don Bend began on the 17th of July, 1942. The Germans anticipated a rapid victory against an enemy they had defeated many times already. But stubborn resistance caused the fighting to drag on for many more days than expected. This hold-up threatened the success of the entire German summer offensive. Paulus's army didn't reach Stalingrad, Army Group A, moving into the Caucasus, could easily become cut off by Soviet counterattacks. 4th Panzer Army, under General Hoth, now swung around to threaten Stalingrad from the south. The city, named after Stalin, was becoming the center of attention. Soon, all the eyes of the world would be upon it. By the end of August 1942, the German 6th Army had wiped out Soviet resistance west of the Don. Red Army survivors were retreating to the eastern bank of the Great River. The Germans were now only 60 kilometers from Stalingrad. Meanwhile, General Hoth tanks were approaching from the south. Hoth's 150-kilometer drive across the steppe allowed him to unexpectedly burst onto the enemy's flank. Soviet troops in this area were part of the Southeastern Front, commanded by General Yerimenka. Near a small railway station, southwest of Stalingrad, they greeted advancing German tanks with volley fire from Katyusha rocket launchers. 
Yerimenko reported to the Stavka High Command. Pilots whom I sent to reconnoiter the battlefield reported that the whole area is on fire. Every bit of it was burning. I conclude that the Katyushas made a lot of trouble there. Hoth's offensive was stopped in its tracks. This success led to Yurimenka's promotion. Soon, he was coordinating the actions of the southeastern and Stalingrad fronts in the defense of the city. Meanwhile, General Paulus's 6th Army was preparing to cross the River Don. Early on the morning of the 21st of August, more than 200 German assault boats were launched onto the waters of the Don. But the soldiers of the Stalingrad front were ready. The Germans were met with heavy fire. Dozens of boats were sunk. But the Germans got ashore and established a beachhead on the east bank of the Don. Soon a pontoon bridge was up and reinforcements flooded across. The next stop was Stalingrad. Stalingrad, known as Tsaritsyn before the revolution, was one of the most beautiful and well-planned cities in pre-war Russia. New factories attracted many young people to the city. In 15 years, its population grew from 85,000 to 450,000 people. The embankment, with its cafes, cinemas and public gardens, was considered the most elegant along the whole of the Volga. The population of Stalingrad had not been evacuated promptly. Only about 100,000, a fifth, had been evacuated by August. At noon on the 23rd of August, panzers of the 6th Army rolled towards Stalingrad. Above them roared the might of Air Fleet 4, saluting the soldiers with their sirens. They were en route to Stalingrad to unleash the heaviest bombing campaign yet seen on the Eastern Front. When the air raid sirens sounded, many people assumed it was a test. Only when the sky became dark with planes and anti-aircraft batteries opened fire did people rush to the shelters. Bombs rained down on the city. Approximately 80% of buildings were destroyed in the first day of bombing. Most of Stalingrad's suburbs were built of wood. Inside the city itself, there were oil storage facilities and timber yards. The city was parched by the August sun. German incendiary bombs caused the whole city to flare up like gunpowder. Rivers of burning oil and petrol flowed towards the Volga. First the surface of the water, and then the ships caught fire. German Air Fleet 4, commanded by General von Richthofen, flew 1,500 missions on the 23rd of August. Its aircraft dropped 1,000 tons of bombs and lost only three aircraft. On that single day, an estimated 40,000 people died in Stalingrad. Most of the survivors fled the city. But some chose to stay and share the city's fate. At about 4 p.m., Paulus's tanks reached the Volga. Approaching Stalingrad from the north, all the Germans could see through their binoculars was fire and smoke. It seemed nothing could prevent the Germans from entering the burning city. And yet, their attempt to take Stalingrad in one swift assault was bloodily repulsed. What's more, infantry and tanks of the Stalingrad front launched a series of counterattacks from the north. Two reserve armies had also reached Stalingrad, 
They were joined by the two former strategists of the Red Army, Marshal Zhukov and Marshal Vasilevsky. Zhukov told Stalin, our swift strike caused the enemy troops to turn their forces away from Stalingrad and direct them against our grouping. This eased the situation in Stalingrad, which otherwise would have fallen to the enemy. A lull of several days followed the initial attack. Stalingrad was half encircled. The 62nd and 64th armies inside the city were cut off from the Stalingrad front. They could only be reinforced and supplied across the Volga River. But the German position was also far from ideal, having to fend off counterattacks from the north and from within Stalingrad itself. It had become clear that the Red Army could never be forced out of the ruins of the city, as long as they received reinforcements and supplies. The original plan for Case Blue had paid little attention to the capture of Stalingrad. Paulus's new orders were to capture the city, destroy the river crossings, and then take up a defensive position. From Stalingrad, he would protect the flank of German forces advancing into the Caucasus. The taking of Stalingrad was regarded as a matter of a few weeks by the German general staff. But Paulus was less gung-ho when he arrived to meet Hitler in his headquarters near Vinitsa in Ukraine. His Sixth Army was far from the force it had been just two months before. It had suffered heavy casualties in the struggle at the Don. And Paulus now had to send his best divisions to defend a left flank that stretched all the way from the Don to the Volga. When Hitler asked him when he would take Stalingrad, Paulus answered, I cannot predict the final date in view of the state of our troops as well as the strength of Russian resistance. On the contrary, I must ask for reinforcement by at least three good divisions. Paulus's army got its reinforcements. Now, Hitler expected Stalingrad to be taken without delay. The 62nd Army was the only defense and hope for the city. It had already been reduced to about one-sixth of its normal strength. There were only about 50 tanks left. Damaged tanks, immobilized but still able to fire, were dug in and turned into fixed gun emplacements. But the city would not hold out for long without substantial reinforcement. On the 9th of September, General Rodimtsev's 13th Guards Rifle Division was dispatched to the city. Three days later, General Vasily Ivanovich Chuikov was put in command of the 62nd Army. At the outbreak of the Russian Revolution, Chuikov was a 17-year-old naval cadet at Kronstadt. By 19, he was commanding a regiment in the Russian Civil War and was twice decorated with the Order of the Red Banner. Chuikov arrived at the 62nd Army's headquarters on the 14th of September. The same day, the Germans began an all-out assault on the city. The German assault on Stalingrad found a weak point in the Soviet defenses, where the 112th Soviet Rifle Division had once stood. Its regiments had been reduced from 2,500 soldiers each to less than 100. Its artillery consisted of one howitzer and one gun of 1902 vintage. The Germans broke through the decimated division and captured the high ground of Mamayev Kurgan. Then they reached the Volga, hoping to seize the central river crossing. If they had succeeded, Stalingrad's fate would have been sealed that same day. Chuikov threw every available man into the battle. He had to buy time for Radimsev's division to cross the river. Every man able to fire a gun was dispatched to the front line. With the river at their backs and Chuikov's declaration that there is no land for us across the Volga, every man knew this was a fight to the death. By now, the Germans had gained control of the southern part of the city and had split Chuikov's 62nd Army from General Shumilov's 64th Army. The German capture of the city's huge grain elevator was seen as a turning point.
Paulus personally chose the grain elevator as the emblem for his soldier's victory badge. But German victory plans were a little premature. The Rodimtsev division prepared to cross the river by night. They had equipped themselves for street fighting, ditching long rifles in favor of submachine guns and anti-tank rifles. When German observers spotted movement on the river, they called in artillery fire, smashing boats and men and causing many to drown. The soldiers who reached the shore were instantly plunged into battle. The Germans occupied the high bank and had a perfect view of Soviet soldiers as they landed. The fighting was soon hand to hand. Men used bayonets, rifle butts and entrenching tools. In brutal, bloody fighting, the Soviets recaptured the embankment and Mill 4, which overlooked the river crossings. With the capture of this position, the river crossings were finally secure once more. Rodimtsev succeeded in forcing the Germans back and recapturing the railway station. His men regained Mameyev Kurgan on the 19th of September. The same day, the Stavka High Command ordered an attack by the Stalingrad Front to link up with the city's defenders. It was repulsed by the Germans, but much needed German manpower was drawn away from the fighting in the city. Fighting in the city raged for two weeks with hardly any respite. On the 27th of September, Paulus launched another assault. Chuikov's task was to hold the city and its industrial centers, but the city was consuming his men at a terrifying rate. Those who survived for any length of time learned new tactics for this ruined urban landscape. Ironically, it was the Germans, by bombing the city to rubble, that had done most to undermine their own tactics. Tanks, the German army's shock weapon, quickly got stuck in the mountains of broken bricks, while from around every corner they were pelted with Molotov cocktails. German bomb aimers were finding it more and more difficult to spot targets in the city. From the air, it was almost impossible to distinguish between Germans and Russians. Nor were the Heinkels very accurate, scattering their bombs over a path of several hundred meters. To further negate German air superiority, Chuikov ordered his men to advance as close as possible to the enemy lines. The distance between Red Army and German positions was reduced to as little as 10 meters. This made it impossible for Heinkels to bomb the enemy without also hitting their own troops. The Germans turned to their Junkers 87 dive bombers. These aircraft were far more accurate than the level bombers. In the Battle of Stalingrad, German dive bombers and their crews operated at the very limit of their endurance. One German pilot flew 228 missions in just three months at Stalingrad. The same number he'd flown in his previous three years of service. On Chuikov's orders, the powerful long-range artillery of the 62nd Army remained on the east bank of the Volga, where it was less exposed to German air raids. Artillery spotters remained in the city, often working from the top floors of buildings. When they found a good target, such as German troops massing for an assault, the spotter would use radio or telephone to direct artillery fire onto their position. The city became an ideal landscape for snipers from both sides. It became almost impossible to move around the city except on all fours. Chuvikov had ordered all commanding officers to join their men on the front line in order to boost morale. He also ordered the formation of assault teams from the infantry companies. These were much more efficient tactical units for the savage street fighting that had developed. An assault team consisted of 20 to 30 of the most experienced soldiers. Their prime weapons were submachine guns, grenades, knives and sharpened entrenching tools. Where possible, the group was supported by a light, mobile anti-tank gun, a tank, anti-tank riflemen, 
or flamethrower teams. It was up to the assault teams to take on the most hazardous of all operations, storming enemy-held buildings. A favorite tactic was to blow a hole in a side wall with the anti-tank gun. Several grenades were thrown in, the soldiers charging in in the wake of the blasts. Basements were cleared with flamethrowers and more grenades. Before entering a room, a soldier would throw a grenade in first, then come in spraying from his submachine gun. Some buildings were contested floor by floor. Soviet assault teams could be on the ground floor, with German defenders above them, and more Soviet troops fighting their way down from the upper floors. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting became common in these battles. It was an arena in which Red Army soldiers seemed to hold a psychological edge over the Germans. The Russian preference for sharp-edged entrenching tools terrified them. Individual buildings turned into fortresses, with covering fire from the surrounding buildings and streets. On the evening of the 27th of September, Sergeant Yakov Pavlov was ordered to lead a patrol to the Consumer Union building, a hundred meters in front of the Red Army lines. The building was an ideal observation point. Pavlov's men fought their way through the building. When the Germans realized their loss, they launched a furious counterattack and were met with heavy fire. The shattered wreck of the Consumer Union building soon had a new name. Official reports and orders all began to call it Pavlov's House. Underground passages were dug, connecting the house with a neighboring factory and block of flats. This allowed reinforcements to reach the house undercover. Loopholes were made to provide firing positions, and the approaches were sewn with mines. In one of the flats, Russian soldiers found a gramophone that had been left behind, but only one record was still intact. They played it constantly, music floating eerily across the ruins during lulls in the fighting, heard by friend and foe alike as the desperate struggle for Pavlov's house went on. Chuikov's 62nd Army headquarters had moved to an open area near some huge oil storage tanks. When German spotters found it, the shells began to fall. Both sides had assumed the storage tanks were empty. When they began to explode into enormous fireballs, it was a nasty shock for everyone. Rivers of burning oil gushed towards Chuikov's headquarters. By a miracle, they escaped, but their telephone lines were incinerated. Chuikov was cut off in this hellish trap for three days. General Yerimenka, on the east bank of the Volga, didn't know where Chuikov's headquarters were or whether the general was alive or dead. At last, a message arrived from Chuikov. It read, we are at the spot where the fire and smoke are thickest. While 62nd Army headquarters looked for a new home, the Germans were building the pressure on the city's defenders. Into the cauldron was thrown Major General Viktor Zuludoyev's airborne division. On the 14th of October, the Germans launched yet another offensive. This time the goal was the tractor factory. Zuludoyev's division was tasked to hold the position against an attack by three German infantry divisions and two panzer divisions. The division commander fought with a submachine gun in his hands, side by side with his paratroopers. A fresh division was arriving at the river crossing to reinforce them, but Zaludoev's men had to hold out until they got there. The Germans next attacked the barricade gun factory. Only volley firing from Katyusha's on the far bank stopped their advance. But elsewhere on the front, the Germans had already reached the Volga, splitting the 62nd Army in half. 
Nobody, not even Chuikov, believes Stalingrad could be held for much longer. On the 16th of October, with the battle raging just 300 meters from his command post, Ludnikov's 138th Rifle Division crossed the river and went straight into action near the Barricade factory. At huge cost, the Germans were repulsed once more. From his own headquarters, Adolf Hitler raged at the failure to take Stalingrad. The BBC said that Stalingrad had swallowed up Hitler's army. Poland, it continued, was occupied in 28 days. During this same time period, the Germans only managed to occupy a few buildings in Stalingrad. France was occupied in 38 days, but in the same time period, the Germans have only managed to cross the street in Stalingrad. The Germans called the fighting in Stalingrad the Rat War. Soldiers fought at ranges of 10 or 20 meters. The soldier who was the fiercest, most cunning, courageous, determined to win at any cost, this was the soldier that would win this fight. Eleventh of November. The Germans reached the Volga near the Barricade factory, encircled Ludnikov's division and split the 62nd Army into three parts. The 138th Division, or as it became known, Ludnikov's Island, clung onto an isolated position 200 meters from the Volga. The river crossings used to ferry Soviet troops and supplies into the city were under constant fire. Now, the Volga began to freeze, and boats could no longer reach the city. The Red Army Air Force was called in. An obsolete biplane bomber, the U-2, would attempt resupply by air. Sacks of food and ammunition were strapped onto the aircraft's wing. The ropes could be quickly untied to let the cargo crash to earth. One pilot recalled, the navigator had a sort of reins. He pulled them and the load fell to earth rather randomly. However, vodka was parachuted. We used to slow down and shout, Ivan, vodka's coming. But such basic methods of resupply could never meet all the needs of the city's defenders. Winter was coming. The Germans believed that their front line, stretching from the Baltic to the Volga, was secure. Their allies, the Hungarians, Romanians and Italians, were responsible for holding the line in the Don region. The German Army High Command didn't seriously consider the possibility of a Soviet offensive in this region. The Red Army was thought to be on the brink of collapse. But as early as September, Red Army generals had been working on a plan that's goal was nothing less than the complete destruction of the German Sixth Army. Soviet forces were to attack towards the town of Kalash. Armies of the Stalingrad Front were to attack simultaneously to complete the encirclement of the Germans. The operation was codenamed Uranus. Three separate fronts were involved. The Don, the Southeastern, and Stalingrad. The operation was planned in complete secrecy. It was time to turn the tables on the German army. On the night of the 18th of November, the eve of the assault, a snowstorm dramatically reduced visibility. Stalin himself had noted, if the bombing preparation is insufficient, the operation will fail. It was completely impossible to fly in these conditions. The bombing raids were cancelled. But it was too late to postpone Uranus. In the southern zone, troops had already crossed the Volga. On the morning of the 19th of November, at 10 minutes to 9, the roar of thousands of guns was only eclipsed by the screams of Katyusha rocket fire. The shelling was done almost blindly through the snowstorm, but the Romanian troops scattered under the first blows of the Red Army. The German 48th Panzer Corps tried to launch a counterattack. They met the attacking Soviet forces head-on, near the village of Ust-Medveditsky. An enormous tank battle raged for more than a day. 
At its end, the German Panzer Corps lay crushed. One of its divisions had been hindered by an unlikely foe. While the division had been in reserve with its vehicle standing idle, field mice had got inside the vehicles and gnawed through the electrical wiring. This humble ally of the Red Army had put dozens of tanks out of action. The Red Army assault south of Stalingrad began the next day. The poorly trained and ill-equipped Romanian 4th Army scattered in the face of a massed Soviet tank assault. Troops from two Soviet fronts were approaching from north and south to meet at the River Don. The severe weather slowed their advance. No local guides could be found in the villages, all of which lay abandoned. At dusk on the 22nd of November, a detachment of two motorized infantry companies, five tanks and one armored vehicle, approached the bridge near the town of Kalash. The capture of this bridge was critical to the success of the whole operation. The German guards on the bridge couldn't believe enemy tanks could be so far behind the front line. By the time they realized their mistake, it was too late. The capture of the bridge allowed the Red Army to move large numbers of troops across the Don to link up with Yerimenka's tanks coming from the south. On the fourth day of Operation Uranus, units of the Stalingrad Front met troops of the Southeastern Front near the town of Sovetsky. The trap was sprung. Paulus's Sixth Army was surrounded. But the act of encirclement alone wasn't enough to guarantee victory. There was no panic amongst the German forces that were now cut off. Hitler told Paulus, the army can rely on my taking every step to provide it with everything it needs and to end its blockade. The surrounded German troops were ordered to hold their positions and wait for rescue. But when a meeting was convened of the 6th Army Corps commanders, most wanted to attempt a breakout. It was General Erwin Janek who gave vent to what many were thinking. Reichenau wouldn't have hung about. Paulus instantly retorted, I'm not Reichenau. Paulus prevailed. Sixth Army would take up defensive positions and await a relief attempt from the outside. Field Marshal von Manstein was given the job of rescuing Sixth Army from its predicament. He quickly gathered all available forces for the offensive, which was to be led by four panzer divisions. The operation was codenamed Winter Storm. Not for nothing was Van Manstein regarded as the best operational mind in the Third Reich. He won the first round of the fight, launching his attack not in the obvious place where the German lines were closest together, but from the southwest. Von Manstein's panzers burst through the perimeter of the Soviet encirclement. The Red Army had been caught off guard. Stalin, alarmed that the prey might be about to escape the trap, immediately ordered Soviet reserves to counter this new threat. But troop movements across this frozen, devastated landscape were no simple task. One unit reported that the trains could not keep up steam. Motor transport was useless for lack of fuel. Communications with units moving on foot was difficult. For the time being, von Manstein's attack would have to be resisted by whatever troops lay in its path. These scattered and often isolated Red Army units fought desperately to keep the Germans at bay. The whole course of the Battle of Stalingrad lay in the balance. General Schulz, von Manstein's chief of staff, tried to persuade Paulus to fight his way out of Stalingrad, towards von Manstein's forces. The earlier your attack starts, the better, Schulz told him. We cannot wait. But Paulus was no longer sure his troops were capable of fighting their way out. He grew increasingly pessimistic as von Manstein's troops were first stopped and then forced into retreat. Hitler had hoped that the Luftwaffe could keep Paulus's men resupplied from the air. But it was unfeasible. Paulus and the Sixth Army were doomed. 
The operation to eradicate German resistance in Stalingrad was codenamed Ring. Before it began, Paulus received an ultimatum demanding his surrender. It was declined on Hitler's orders. The Red Army also appealed directly to ordinary German soldiers to surrender. Red Army Air Force pilot Li Shenko had the unenviable job of flying his U-2 at low altitude over the front lines, while his navigator of Shisha read an ultimatum to the German soldiers through a loudspeaker. They often came under heavy fire from the ground. Li Shenko would climb out of range and repeat the whole process somewhere else 15 minutes later. Some German soldiers believed they would get food and warmth if they surrendered. Others feared reprisals. Many were scared to disobey orders. Military discipline was maintained within Stalingrad. Deserters and thieves were still shot wherever they were caught. Operation Ring began on the 10th of January with an intense artillery bombardment. The German pocket was about 60 by 40 kilometers. Now the Germans were driven east to the Volga and into Stalingrad. Four days into the operation, the Germans were forced to abandon their main airfield at Pitomnik. This was a disaster. Fights broke out over places on the last German aircraft to leave. The wounded were forgotten. The most deserving were elbowed aside. The only supplies that reached Paulus's army now arrived by parachute. Many soldiers had fallen into complete apathy, numbed by cold and hunger, only brought to life by the sound of a transport aircraft overhead. Food had become their only concern. On the 24th of January, Paulus sent a radio message to Hitler, which ended with the words, the army requests permission to surrender immediately in order to save the lives of the remaining troops. The Führer was adamant. I forbid capitulation, he replied. The army will hold its positions until the last soldier and the last ditch. The Soviet advance had split the German pocket into two parts. The southern part was trapped in the heart of the city. The northern lay in the factory district. Paulus's headquarters was in the southern pocket. The suffering of his men finally forced him to act. He surrendered on the morning of the 31st of January with his staff. The northern group under Lieutenant General Karl Strecker fought on briefly. After a massive Soviet artillery pounding, they too laid down their arms on the 2nd of February, 1943. The final surrender at Stalingrad resulted in 91,000 German soldiers being taken prisoner. They had destroyed 6,000 guns and mortars, 1,000 German tanks, and more than 60,000 assorted vehicles. The disaster that had overtaken Paulus' army and two Romanian armies stunned Germany. It was their first major defeat at Soviet hands. On the Eastern Front, the Stavka High Command launched a full-scale offensive that routed Italian and Hungarian armies along the Don River. German forces began a headlong retreat from the Caucasus to avoid being cut off. Hitler would never reach the oil fields of Baku. All of Germany's conquests in the South that summer were reversed. The Soviet winter offensive stopped only in March 1943. Amongst the many towns and cities liberated by the Red Army was the city of Kursk. It was there that the war's next great battle would be fought.